Hi there, and welcome to the Nerds of Business podcast. My name is Darren Moffat. I'm a director at WebBuzz, the growth marketing agency, and I'm your host. It's great to have you with us for the final episode in the series, Mindset of the Disruptive Entrepreneur. So far, each episode has considered an aspect of the positive mindset. We've looked at resilience, creativity, confidence, and drive. We've also taken a dive into the negative and destructive behaviours that can sometimes overwhelm entrepreneurs. And finally, today, we're looking at the concept of leadership, and in particular, what it takes to be a true leader in a venture that aims to disrupt a market or challenge the established order. So what, or perhaps who, springs to your mind when you hear the term leadership? Perhaps you might conjure images of historical figures such as Winston Churchill or Abraham Lincoln, or recent iconic entrepreneurs such as Bill Gates or Oprah Winfrey. Leadership is actually a funny thing. It's both ubiquitous and elusive. Everyone at some stage has had a boss in the workplace, so we're all familiar with the concept of being led. But true leadership, the kind that inspires and transforms, is unusual. You know it when you see it, if only because you see it all too rarely. To help define this true leadership, I went looking for a story and, as I often do, I turned to pop culture for inspiration. Dolly Parton is known all over the world as an icon of country music and a brilliant entrepreneur. She's even got her own theme park, Dolly World in Tennessee. What a lot of people don't know about Dolly is that in her day... She was a massive disruptor. Until she came along in the 1960s, the country music industry was completely dominated by men. They wrote the music, they produced the records, and they controlled the money. Dolly changed all that. She took control of her own career and was a trailblazer for other female artists who emerged in the decades that followed, such as Joni Mitchell, Madonna, Taylor Swift, and even Beyonce. Although Dolly got rich and famous by creating an outsized personal brand, there's a lot more to her than the makeup and the big hair. She's fiercely intelligent, and as you're about to hear in our opening story, drawn from a little-known episode of her later life, she's also a true leader. The year is 2016 when a series of wildfires ravage the Smoky Mountains in the state of Tennessee, America. Its most famous resident, Dolly Parton, monitors the fires closely from her home as they spread for several weeks unabated in the hills nearby. Although her theme park, Dolly World, is spared, 14,000 local residents are forced to evacuate and over 2,000 buildings are damaged or destroyed. Ultimately, 14 lives are lost. Upon seeing the extent of the crisis and its impact on her community, Dolly takes decisive action. First, she organises resources for the relief effort by calling upon her music and media contacts to help. Secondly, she communicates with the public. She immediately releases a series of video statements stressing the resilience of the local people, the magnitude of the crisis, and her own efforts to bring as much relief as possible to the region. In fact, her communications are notable for the consistency and frequency of key messages. Knowing the importance of the money that tourism brings to a local economy, she encourages anyone who had planned a trip to the Smoky Mountains to follow through and come, despite the fire. Whenever someone in the media asks her what's the best thing people can do to help, her response is always to visit. And her constant focus on positive messages of renewal, opportunity and growth, rather than pity or loss, helped to build morale and a sense of hope for the future. Soon enough, Dolly Parton's efforts begin to pay off. The year following the fires, tourism in the region breaks all records generating an estimated $1.3 billion in revenue, up 3% from the previous year. Parton continues to help people recover from the wildfires, 
She stages a telethon that raises $9 million. She pledges $3 million of her own money to help victims of the crisis. And she donates an additional $5,000 to more than 900 families affected by the tragedy. It's a masterclass in crisis management, vision and communication. And the results prove beyond any doubt that good leadership can have a profound impact on the lives of others. If, like most of the public, you have a one-dimensional view of Dolly Parton as the almost cartoonish country singer, then you can be forgiven for thinking her leadership during the fires was an aberration. But you'd be wrong. She's actually got plenty of form in this area. For instance, in 1995, she helped tackle the crisis of early childhood literacy by launching the Imagination Library. What a wonderful name that is. This is a book giveaway program that has donated over 150 million books to school children around the world, which goes to show that good leadership in an individual tends not to be a passing fad. For those who are unfamiliar with the full Dolly Parton story, I strongly recommend you listen to a podcast called Dolly Parton's America. It's a truly astonishing piece of journalism. Aside from providing a fascinating take on American culture, it will also give you an incredible insight into Dolly Parton's long and storied career. There's much to admire, but two things stand out. Firstly, she became a disruptor out of pure necessity. If she was to achieve her dreams, she needed to first smash the established norms of the country music industry patriarchy. And that was a very big achievement in the 1960s and 70s. And second is that although Dolly was a prolific collaborator, she was always a leader at heart. If you're running a business or planning to launch a startup, what can you do to tap the power of true leadership and inspire your team to greatness? I love data. I I love kind of looking through the data. You need to have systems, you need to have structure. You're going to get chopped to pieces. Enthusiasm is unstoppable. We kind of hit a point where we were like, we need another lever. Drown yourself with people who are smarter than you and richer than you. (laughs) This is Nerds of Business. So the title of today's episode and the problem we're trying to solve is how to adapt the unique leadership lessons of disruptive entrepreneurs to bring your business vision to life. It's a big show today and we've got some truly awesome guests. Up soon you'll hear from a business psychologist on the theory of effective leadership and a seasoned investor in the startup ecosystem who reveals what qualities that she looks for in founders. And in a special treat, several of our entrepreneur guests from previous episodes return to share who their favorite iconic business leaders are and why. But first, here's just a quick reminder that if you're enjoying Nerds of Business, to please hit the subscribe button on your podcast player. It means you'll automatically receive each new episode every fortnight, and it makes it easier for us to stay in touch. Even a cursory glance at the business section of any bookstore will give you some idea of the interest in the topic of leadership. There have been many thousands of books written on the subject over the years. For today's episode, I wanted to take a different approach, so I turned to our mindset expert for this series, Stephanie Thompson. Stephanie is a qualified psychologist and business coach based in Sydney, Australia, with over 25 years' experience helping executive leaders and entrepreneurs to optimize their mindset and performance. She's the founder of her practice, Insight Matters, and she's regularly in the media appearing on the ABC, Channel 9, Financial Review, and more. I began by asking her to deconstruct the components that need to come together for good leadership. She goes on to explain the concept of emotional contagion, which is as fascinating as it sounds, and what entrepreneurs can do to improve their strategic thinking. A lot of the literature indicates that vision is in fact a hallmark of a great leader. What exactly is this kind of vision thing from a clinical perspective? 
I think of it as the ability to foresee or to create first in the imagination that which you would like to make manifest in reality. Oh, nice. And importantly, to communicate that in a way that enables others to envision it. Yes, and, you know, that's a nice segue into the next question because to be able to communicate that vision is obviously the secret source, you know. Like it's one thing to have a vision, but, you know, to communicate and to get other people excited by it, you know, that's where the magic happens, right? So now apparently uh, that is – part of that is what's called emotional contagion, um, Mm -hmm. which is a term I learned. From you, I wasn't aware of that before. Um, can you tell us a bit what what a bit about that? What is emotional contagion? Well, we infect each other with emotion, any emotion. So it can be fear or indignance or playfulness or happiness, and it seems to spread on its own because we're a social species and we look to each other for indicators of is everything okay or not. Yeah. Um, in a team or a family, actually, or in a business, it tends to be the person who has the strongest energy, who leads the emotion, the emotional leader. In fact, that's an aspect of charisma, ah. is being able to be being the emotional uh, core. Um, and in a business, of course, it's also whoever has, by implication, permission of sorts, so usually the boss. Yep. Um, and in the the wider community we can see it very easily with media emotional contagion very much driven am i right in thinking that this emotional contagion is uh, to use a very tortured mangled metaphor um it's kind of like the the super highway for the vision you know like it's it, it's what transmits the vision and gets it sp- spreading so to speak into other people or across across a community that is a, a- Big part of it, I would say, yes. So enthusiasm, enthusiasm, um, yeah, being infectious. Being we talk infectious. about that. We say, oh, so and so's enthusiasm is infectious. Yeah, it's yeah. A, it might be a good term to use in another time, but right now in the middle of COVID <laughs> lockdown, uh, maybe not. Yes. But I take your well, meaning. Good, good things are infectious too. That's true. That is true. Yes. And so here's a practical question that I think a lot of our listeners will be very interested in. What can entrepreneurs do to be better um, at the persuasion? Because essentially what you're talking about, there is to some extent persuasion. Um, what can they do to be better at the persuasion required for visionary leadership? Hmm. I might challenge that question a little bit, actually. Oh, because okay. I th- yes, I think that... If you have visionary leadership, technically persuasion is not really required. Interesting. Because the vision is inherently compelling. Right. So it's more about communicating or talking about what you want to create over and over. Maybe using graphics too that helps people to visualize if if your concept lends itself. Most concepts do lend themselves to a visual communication of some kind. Well, that's that is that's fascinating, particularly for startup founders, right? Because um, if you're a startup founder and you've you've got a an idea, you've got a vision, uh, you want to affect change in the world with a certain product or business model. Venture capitalists and, and investors are notoriously uh, unsusceptible to persuasion. That's their job. Mm-hmm. Their job is to be impervious to salesmanship, persuasion, mm-hmm. charisma. Conf, overconfidence and so on, right? So um, that what you're saying um, would seem to sort of bear that out. That ultimately, it's it's the the strength and the value of the vision uh, is co- is core. But then how that is 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 communicated and the energy and enthusiasm behind that is that a, is that a fair call? Yes, it's a good summary. Mm. Okay, cool. Now, strategic thinking. You know, there's been thousands of books on strategic thinking it's a it was a really big buzzword i think you know sort of back in the 80s and 90s it's still around of course but Mm -hmm. uh, it's less less buzzy than it once was so a lot a lot of books and business coaches talk about this what exactly is this strategic thinking i get this one a lot actually it's quite a common thing when i'm dealing with some the the leader of a business and they're complaining that their next tier of staff are not strategic enough 
or somebody in the next tier who's trying to get promoted and saying, my boss says I'm not strategic enough. How do I do this? What oh, is this? Okay. Um, and I think usually it, it re- really just means they're not business minded enough. So the head is in the detail perhaps or in the task or in the skill, but they're not quite grasping the bigger picture of cause and effect in business. They're fixating on daily activities, not fully considering the ways in which it translates into value or not. So strategic thinking is really about finding or creating ways to generate value. It has a long-term quality to it and a big picture quality. Yeah. So it's the opposite of the everyday and the tactical. And, yes. and what I liked about you, um, what you just said was the linking of it to the, the delivering of value so that mm. it's not just strategic thinking is not just kind of scheming and, you know, moving the chess pieces around. It's actually with an outcome in mind to deliver value for shareholders or stakeholders or what have you. And Stephanie will return later in the episode with some important insights into authenticity. So stick around for that. Authenticity was a strong theme in the chat with my next guest. Rachel Newman is the founder of Flying Fox Ventures, an early stage venture firm for angel investors based in Melbourne, Australia. Prior to that, she was the Managing Director of Eventbrite for Australia and New Zealand and the Head of Startups at Amazon Web Services, where she's worked with literally thousands of entrepreneurs. She's also served as the Chair of Startup Oz, Australia's National Startup Advocacy and Lobbying Group. So she's a highly respected leader in the startup ecosystem who knows exactly what it takes to be a disruptive entrepreneur. Listen to Rachel as she reveals the leadership qualities that investors like her look for in startups and why founders need to have a magnetic quality about them. So at Flying Fox, we have this term where we we say empathy and execution, and we need to see those in equal parts. So empathy is deeply understanding that customer problem, as I talked about, deeply understand the market that you're trying to work in, deeply understanding what the competitive landscape is and what your value prop needs to be. And then execution is how do you just build, 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 and just keep, you know, going at it, iterating, failing, falling down, fixing, et cetera. So you need to have those in even parts. Now you talked about vision and often for our types of companies, we need our founders to be really ambitious and to have a really big and bold vision of what the, how the world is going to be different when their product is in its full life cycle. But what we need also is someone who knows what to do in the next six weeks. And it's a really fine balance. It's not always held in the same person. And so sometimes what we're looking for is founding teams or complementary pairings where you have a really big visionary leader and then someone who's able to distill that down into, okay, that's where we need to be in five years, but where do we need to be in the next 12 months? And then where do we need to be in the next six months? And then what do we do today? And I'm working with one of my portfolio companies right now, um, and they just hired an incredible CTO. And we're super excited um, about this hire. It's a real win for um, the company, and it's going to be a great pairing. And he's a very visionary CTO. And now we also need to hire a head of product. And in order to complement that visionary CTO, we're going to need a product manager and a product leader who is a little bit more tactical um, and is able to translate a visionary leader into what needs to be done today and tomorrow. And so that is what we're looking for. Now, what's important from a leadership perspective is that vision needs to be communicated to a team. And everyone on that team needs to understand what is the big picture vision here that we're all driving towards? And how does my little thing, even if I'm just the person who puts the toilet paper on the roll, but how does the little thing that I do translate into the bigger vision? And so good leaders have that vision. Great leaders help everyone to understand what is my job to do today in order to achieve that vision. Yeah. Well, thanks. That That's chock full of insights. Um, I almost don't know where to start, um, but um, there's, there's so much there. And I think I, I like the way you broke it down essentially into the, the strategic versus the tactical. Um, and that's, that's often the key nexus point. You know, it's, you've got to have the strategy, but if you're, crap at the tactics, you know, the whole thing's going to fall down. 
And uh, I think well, I think what was it Mark Zuckerberg who always said, you know, perfect is. He, I think he says like you know ship ship, not perfection. I'm I'm botching it now. I remember visiting the Facebook office and seeing the sign there, but that's also really important. Just in a fast paced company, you need to hold tight to the to the vision and be unwavering in that. But you can't be stubborn in how you're going to get there. Yep. And the and you have to just keep shipping. That's how you're going to learn how you're going to get there. The path, the actual roads you're going to take are going to be very different to how you thought you were going to get there. Yeah. Um, well, that's fascinating. And in that context, um, what about the the the, the topic or, or or the the tool of persuasion? So. Um, you know, how important do you think persuasion is in the startup founder? Because it, clearly there's a, there's, there's, there's a sales process going on here. They're selling themselves and their idea to you. Um, so, you know, how does that factor in? Like, do you find yourself sometimes being swept up by a founder who's a very good salesperson, but n- maybe the idea isn't, isn't quite where it needs to be? Yeah. And um, I think that I now, because like I said, I, I literally talk to hundreds of companies a year, I usually know when I'm being sold to. I'm always being sold to, right? Um, but that's okay because I'm like, wow, she can sell. And the ability to sell a, you know, eight out of 10 product will always be a 10 out of 10 product with no one who knows how to sell it. Yeah. So it's actually a very important skill. It's important for me to be able to see that they actually have that ability because we need them to be magnets, right? Early stage founders are magnets for talent and magnets for customers. So I need to be able to see that demonstrated Mm -hmm. somehow, some way. And sometimes we have founders who are not very magnetic, but they can write great code that becomes magnetic, right? That code becomes magnetic for customers because it uh, in a digital way acquires them or it can acquire talent because they're like, wow, this is incredible technology. Um, So I need them to do that, but then I need them to be real with me. You know, at a certain point, they need to drop the and I need to say, listen, I need to be on your team. You need to tell me warts and all. And I recently had a conversation. I won't say who it was, but one of my portfolio companies is in in a fundraise process right now. And, um, you know, I checked in with him to say, hey, you know, what's the update? And he spun the story a bit. And I just said, hey, pause. I said, I am on your team. Do not, do not spin to me. Like I can only help you if I know the real story. Like let's be one, you need to be intellectually honest with it, with yourself Two, You need to be honest with me. Like you don't need to sell me. I'm already in, I'm in and I'm in forever and I'm on your team. Now let's actually talk about what's ugly here so that we can fix it. And I think that is where persuasion has its limitations. If someone thinks that they can just continue to use that with their investors, you're just, um, it's just a missed opportunity because investors usually are not there because they want everything to be perfect. They're there because they want to dig in and make this, make this a success for everyone involved. And we can't do that if we are being lied to or being excluded from the truth. Now it's my job to build up that relationship so they feel comfortable doing that. Yeah. And so that's where the onus is on both parties. Yeah, great answer. I mean, you know, I think it's, it's, it's something you only really know through experience, but that sort of obfuscation, that spin, you know, that's a friction point on the growth. You know, that's actually holding, holding you back because it, it's taking longer to get to the problem and then to solve it. Mm. I'll just go back to Muso. Um, like I said, they just raised around. Um, and one of the things I, they went and um, pitched to a, a fund who, who came into this round. And when I checked in with the partner of the fund, I said, Oh, you know, how did Jeremiah go? They said, we loved him. Not because he said everything was perfect, but because he told us all the ways in which they failed in the last year and how much they've learned from that. And so people also sometimes underestimate us, the investors. We don't want a perfect fairy tale story. We know, especially the earlier stage that we're investing in, we know you're covered in pimples and warts and you are a super awkward teenager. We're not investing in you because you're hot. 
We're investing in you because we think you will become a hottie. <laughs> we know that you are awkward and ugly now. So it's like, just show it all to us because then we know what to work with. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's such a good analogy. And um, we could, we could take that a lot further, but then it might, it might get, a, <laughs> might get a little ugly. Yeah, let's not. Yeah, yeah, let's not. Um, <laughs> Talk to any leading entrepreneur for a while and you'll notice that they each tend to study iconic business leaders for ideas and inspiration. Morgan Coleman is the founder of platform Vets on Call. Launched in 2018, Vets on Call is disrupting the $3.7 billion market for pet health by using tech to bring vets into the homes of pet owners, thereby avoiding the stress and hassle of a traditional visit to the vet clinic. I asked Morgan to nominate an entrepreneur who he rates highly for leadership. His answer might surprise you. So there's two that come to mind. Um, one is Richard Branson because yeah. I do love what he does and his ability to take the Virgin brand and, and put it into different marketplaces. I think that's amazing. Um, but I really love his attention to customer detail. And I think that to me is what really resonates with me as a, as a business owner. Um, and similarly, the guys from Airbnb, what they've been able to do in terms of their customer experience, the way that, and, and using tech to build a relationship with their clients, like that to me is the ultimate. And that's exactly what we try and do. And that's something that I'm constantly questioning our team about. Okay, well, how do we take what we're doing and replicate the kind of relationship that they would get from a traditional service through our tech. Yes. And I think what the guys at Airbnb have done is, you know, that um, incredibly well. Yes. Um, one of my other guests nominated, uh, Brian Chesky, is the, uh, the the main founder and CEO of uh, Airbnb. And, yeah, very, very impressive. I mean, what those guys did uh, with the pandemic and the, and the lockdown, you know, they actually um, – created an endowment fund and they shared the money uh, without any obligation to their hosts who were relying on this, you know, income uh, mm. and that suddenly dried up because of, because of the uh, COVID and they, uh, you know, they gave some money back to, to their hosts and, and like, so I think, you know, that's a good example of what you're talking about um, and that is most unusual behaviour. You don't, you rarely see that um, you know, in in entrepreneurs or business people and, and that – how much goodwill does something like that buy? You know, like that's – you know, not only is it the right thing morally to do, you know, uh, I listened to an interview with him on this on this topic um, on Masters of Scale. Are you familiar with that podcast? Yes, I'm that one. Yeah, it's yeah, a good one. Yeah, it's a good one. Uh, <laughs> listeners have probably heard me sort of recommend that multiple times now, but it is so good. And so, yes, I, I – great choice. I think I think what those guys are, are doing is, is fabulous. And I asked the same question of one of our other recurring guests in this series, Chris Brikey. Chris is the founder and CEO of Stockspot, which is Australia's leading share investing platform. Listen to what Chris has to say about his inspirations for business leadership. So going back to my roots were as an investor and as a trader. So I loved trading shares as a kid and I was always insp inspired by people who were famous and, and fantastic and well-regarded investors. And so probably one of the ones I was inspired by is one that's controversial, which is probably fitting because, you know, we've created controversy in our industry. Um, so Ray Dalio, who I'm sure you've uh, heard of and, and many of your listeners would Ray have, Dalio, yeah. um, his style of managing his business is extremely controversial. Um, you know, publicly and, and privately, there are people that have said it's terrible. There are people that have said it's great. What I think is that it's very interesting because one of the insights I have from the investing world is in order to be a successful investor who's trying to beat the market, um, you need to get one main thing right, which is that you need to make calls that are anti-consensus and right at the same time because mm. it's easy to make anti-consensus calls that are wrong and easy to make consensus calls that are right. And that's what most people end up doing in, in the investment world. But you need to do the thing that's really hard is know when everyone else is wrong. And, and he's like brought into his business, I think like a really interesting and unique kind of management process and style to help their business do that more successfully, which I think he describes as radical transparency, um, you know, a meritocracy, where they actually try and quantify um, 
you know, how good people are at making decisions and then weight their decision making process based on that sort of quantitative method. I think he's done a TED talk on it and he has, um, he's sort of talked quite openly about it. Now, it's definitely not a management style that would work in all businesses. And there's certainly a lot that it would work terribly in, you know, being 100% honest with people because he expects people to come up to him, even as the leader of a hedge fund managing hundreds of billions of dollars to tell him when he's done an awful job. But to be able to back that up with, you know, why and, and to really own that. And, and I, I mean, I really respect that as a kind of a leadership style and management style. Um, I think in his business, it works fantastically because that's what you really need in order to beat the market is you need people that are prepared to debate things openly without it being a personal, you know, a, a personal fight. Mm. Um, and, and I think it's just a good model and a unique model for, for the business that it is. Would it work in every yeah, business? Definitely not. Um, I've thought about it for our business. I'm not sure whether it's, it's quite right. Um, but yeah, for me, it's, that was just great out of the box thinking in an area that wasn't ultimately his area of expertise, like management, he, he's an investment expert that, yeah, I think sort of has made a lot of people think. Oh, he's, he's really interesting, exciting person. And he's got a great book out at the moment, which you may well have read called principles. Um, so that's, that's, uh, are you familiar with that book? So funnily enough, before I started Stockspot, I read that, but before it was a book, it was just a PDF downloadable document. I downloaded it and printed it and read it in the year that I was uh, starting the business. Oh, wow. There you go. Okay. And and the other thing that um, I know about Ray Dalio, you would definitely know more than I do, but uh, I was listening to a podcast with him uh, and some someone else. He was being interviewed and and he was talking about what you were just describing, his very uh, contrarian um, nature. Uh, and um, uh, and he, you know he's obviously a risk taker and and you know he he nearly lost it all you know like he, he was it was back I think in the early eighties he made some massive call um, and it was the wrong call I mean he 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 just almost got taken to the cleaners so uh, but but he learnt that was the really interesting thing about the story he told it was a massive lesson for him it was seared into his brain. And it was obviously something that set him up for the rest of his life uh, in terms of you know, um, his uh, capability and um, and ultimately you know where he's ended up. Yeah, that's right. I mean, in the share market, the wonderful thing about the share market is it humbles you very quickly when you're wrong. And I think that's what I love about it is there are so many areas of life where you never really know if you were right or wrong. And there's a lot of confident people that ultimately have no idea what they're talking about, but never get shown up to not have any idea about what they're talking about because there isn't a way to quantify that. The share market, there is a great way to quantify it. It's your returns. <laughs> and so the, I think to be successful in the share market, you need to be able to accept that the market is right and you're wrong and learn from that rather than just get angry and say everyone else is wrong and I was right because it's not the case. Everyone else was right and you were wrong. <laughs> the notion of authenticity is commonly seen as a prerequisite for effective leadership. If you're a business owner or an entrepreneur who wants to become a better leader, you won't want to miss this next segment. Business psychologist Stephanie Thompson shares why it's so important, and we discuss how the power of storytelling can help project authenticity. Well, they say authenticity is the corner of the cornerstone of business. Yeah. And once you learn to fake that, you've got it made. You beat me to the punch. I was that I was going to yes. bring that one in, but you, you're Were right. You? If you can fake you authenticity. You've got it made, yeah. Yes, yes, you would have delivered it better, I'm sure. No, in all seriousness, um, it's, a, it's a charming quality. It is a value issue, though, in that people who are authentic tend to be very strongly drawn to others who are authentic. Yep. It's just, oh, thank goodness, there's no game here. What a relief, straightforward to person to deal with. Yep. Um, I, I find it a very charming and attractive trait, um, and yes, but I wouldn't say it, it's universal. It's far from universal. There'd be many, many leaders who are effective, actually, in their own way, and sometimes highly effective who don't necessarily have the authenticity component. But uh, for those uh, who do value authenticity or who are naturally authentic, um, how can those entrepreneurs project that authenticity? Like what, what are the um, – I don't want to say sort of tricks of the trade. That's not the right framing, but – uh, what are the methods mm. <laughs> by which they can they can project that? Mm, yes, it's almost an oxymoron because I would suggest that authenticity is not actually projected. It, okay. 
just is. It just is, yeah. It's that's the nature of authenticity. Yeah. And if you're projecting it, you're probably faking it. Yeah. So don't do that. Yeah. Ironically. Um, and I think it comes down to a bit of advice that's just good advice in general for life, which is to be yourself. Be yourself. Speak your truth. Yeah. Uh, yes, be considerate, be reasonably polite, but don't try to create yourself as someone other than who you actually are. Um, let, you know, in the mold of someone else. And let your business be itself as well. I, I think that's, um, you know, all great advice. But I, I guess I'm putting my marketing hat on now. And mm-hmm. I, I've seen other other people in business do this, where they, they use their story, their personal story, to project a sense of mm-hmm. authenticity, right? And, you know... That strikes me as being a very powerful technique. People seem to relate to storytelling. Um, as mm. a, 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 do you have any thoughts on that? Actually, yes, that's very true. And sharing of your story is um, more and more popular, actually, these days, in that some seem to be of a view that, yes, you shouldn't let too much be known about yourself. Don't give away too much personal stuff. But the reality is we love these stories about people. We love to know the real human being behind something and so i'm I'm in two minds i understand the caution that people have about revealing self too much on the other hand you know if you're a a reasonable human being what's the worst that can happen people find it very compelling to uh to hear the true story behind something they do um but you know like it's 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 in the way it's handled like i know someone in business uh i don't know her very well but she's lovely but um, she uh, got on social media a while ago and kind of revealed an aspect of her sexuality. Um, mm-hmm. And it, I mean, it was very brave. It was a very brave thing to do. But um, I didn't feel it was authentic. I, I thought it mm-hmm. was – and maybe, maybe that's just me, you know. Um, so it's no judgment at all about the, se- the sexuality itself – it was the way it was done. She revealed mm. this aspect of her uh, innermost self to the public and I think mm-hmm. it was really driven by a need for more attention on social media. Right, yes. And and so I was struck by that doesn't feel authentic to me. So, mm. yeah, mm. I mean – what do you think it's of that? Interesting. It's interesting, isn't it? Yes, when it's done strategically or it's got some other intent, it's not a true sharing. It's not a true gift. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just didn't, in this case, I didn't feel it. It didn't illuminate any wider point about her or what was going on. It was. It mm. just seemed to be, look at me, look at me. Yeah. So anyway, um, yes, as you say, Don't fake it. Be yourself. So the problem we set out to solve in this episode was how to adapt the unique leadership lessons of disruptive entrepreneurs to bring your business vision to life. Our mindset expert, Stephanie Thompson, revealed the psychological theory behind leadership and Rachel Newman shared her insights as a leading investor in the startup ecosystem in Australia. And we've also heard Fascinating takes on some iconic business leaders from our entrepreneur guests, Morgan Coleman of Vets on Call and Chris Brockey of Stockspot. I hope their wisdom and insights have given you ideas to crack the code to growth in your own business. For me, there are three key conclusions we can all take out from this episode. Number one, vision is great, but it needs to be communicated to the team. I loved what Rachel had to say on this. It's not enough to have a compelling vision of how your business or your product will change the world. You must communicate this clearly and often to the people around you and, of course, to the market. Number two, enthusiasm is the transmitter of vision. As Stephanie explained, the person with the strongest energy in the organisation leads the emotion in the team. This is often called charisma And it's hard to get people to buy into a vision without it. Number three, it's important to be real. 
As Rachel said, persuasion has its limits, especially with investors. Although storytelling is a powerful technique to amplify authenticity, the fake it until you make it ethos that seems to proliferate in startup culture can be a serious handicap when it comes to dealing with investors. As we heard at the top of the episode in the Dolly Parton story, disruptors often become incredible leaders simply because they are the first to forge a new path. Such leadership takes courage, charisma, tenacity, confidence, creativity, and the ability to execute well both tactically in the short term and strategically in the long term. Whilst good leadership can of course be learnt, it seems clear to me that it's way more than just another skill. Perhaps the right way to think about it is as a kind of lifestyle choice. Good leaders don't turn it on and off. They're committed to it 24-7, 365 days a year. It becomes a way of life. And it might just be the secret sauce that you need to take your business all the way to the top. We're coming to the end, but before we go, it's time for our regular segment, Nerd Under Pressure, where a guest has to share one killer hack or tip they can recommend for you, our listeners. Let's find out who our Nerd Under Pressure is today. Morgan, we now come to a very famous segment here on Nerds of Business called Nerd Under Pressure. So, Nerd Under Pressure, and today, Morgan Coleman of Vets on Call, you are our disruptive tech nerd, uh, or perhaps we can call you the, the fluffy animal nerd, something along those lines. Uh, uh, you're, in the, you're in the hot seat. We're asking for one killer hack or tip you can give to other business owners for launching and scaling a disruptive Tech startup. I'm going to give you five seconds thinking time. All right, over to you. So my tip would be hypothesize, test, reiterate, and just re- rinse and repeat. Great. Yeah. So it's really before you get out there and you spend all the money and you build the tech and you know uh, really sort of commit yourself financially and emotionally. Do the testing at the start, yeah? You need to be testing your hypothesis. And even even now, we still do it. Like on a day-to-day basis, you know, we're running experiments and what will work, what won't. But before we run the experiments, like, okay, well, what do we think will work? Yeah. You know, um, and we're measuring all those sorts of things. So, and then if they work, then we reiterate it and we start again. So thanks for listening to episode 31 of the Nerds of Business podcast. If you've enjoyed it, please leave a review on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcast. It helps us climb up the ranks and become more visible to other people just like you. Remember, we want to help as many entrepreneurs and businesses as possible. If you've got a question or some feedback, we'd love to hear from you. You can engage with us at our website, nerdsofbusiness.com that's nerdsofbusiness.com so feel free to reach out and say hello i want to thank all of our guests and the team at webbuzz for helping me put this show together that's it for this series we'll be taking a break for a little while until we return with season four but in the meantime we'll be back in a few weeks with a series of uncut specials until then i'm your host darren moffat and i look forward to nerding out with you next time Bye for now.